Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored that the organizing committee has invited me to talk about the specific topic of surgical techniques in arterial venous fistula creation. I am a surgeon, but I have a special interest in medical education, and I put together this presentation with the main emphasis on surgical techniques of AVF creation, and hope you enjoy it. This is basically how I do it. I first started doing AVF in 1986, and I'm not a vascular surgeon, I'm a urologist. And may, you may wonder why I also do AVF. As my colleague, Mr. Anga said just now, there are so many AVF to be done that actually any surgeon or any doctor who have an interest in AVF, in the care of these patients, can train themselves to do AVF. Uh, on the average, I probably do about one per week. I look at the program for today. It is an excellent program, and I look forward to learning from everybody in this room. This is me doing the operation with an ocular loop times four with a OT nurse and if the instruments next to me, so that it's very convenient for me to reach out to the instruments with the minimal of, of assistance. This was my old logbook when I first started doing. In those days, we don't even have a laptop to keep our logbook. So the typical arterial venous fistula is actually a radio catholic fistula from the radial, radial artery to the catholic vein. And the main anastomosis that I do is a side-to-side -side anastomosis and by tying the distal vein in continuity to convert it into more like a side-to-side -side, uh, no, side -side kind of anastomosis. You can also do an end to side anastomosis or even an end to end anastomosis. Doing an end to end anastomosis is usually done in children where we want to have maximum flow to the catholic vein. It's not so suitable for adults because the radial artery also supplies to the hand. And if the radial artery is tied off, then you rely entirely on the ulnar artery for blood supply to the hand. The requirement for an AVF. As mentioned this morning by Dr. Claire Tan, is that you must have an arterial flow of about 300 to 600 mils per minute. The vein must be dilated to about six millimeters, should be of low pressure. The vein should be superficial so that you can put the needle in easily. When you do a BBF, sometimes there's a very good thrill, but the basilic vein is quite deep and it's very difficult to puncture. The vein should pre preferably be thickened or arterialized so that there will be less uh, blow out of the vein after puncture. The vein should be about six centimeters long so that the, the in, inflow and outflow are separated and there's less recirculation of the two, of the two needles. You should have enough length to rotate the sides of puncture. Uh, initially, there'll be pain, uh, but by doing this rotating of the, we're using a rope leather uh, technique of cannulation, you have less chance of venous stenosis or venous blowout. So I always mark my, uh, uh, artery and vein before the surgery, I occlude the vein with a blood pressure cuff of 100, 100 millimeters of mercury for a few minutes. I give the patient a ball to exercise. And of course, the surgeon must see the patient for informed consent to make sure that they are not taking warfarin or plavix. Caspirin is permissible, and this will be one of my MCQ questions. The post-operative care is important because many of these patients are very poor patients. They may come on a motorbike, they may have to do gardening, they may have to do manual work and have to do showers. The blood pressure in such patients sometimes are difficult uh, to, to, to maintain. If the blood pressure is less than 100, then there's, there is a possibility that uh, there may be hypotension and the AVF will fail. If the blood pressure is poorly controlled, if the blood pressure is more than 200, they have, can have a lot of bleeding. The patient must understand that the AVF is not necessarily follow up by dialysis. It is a preparation for dialysis, of course, and it's not a cure for end-stage renal failure. Usually, I do not need ultrasound for mapping the vessels. Uh, I have an ultrasound in my consultation room, which belongs to the dialysis unit, and of course, we can use this free of charge. But generally speaking, clinic assessment is very important. So I mark up the artery and the vein, and if the vein has a stenosis, this is, you should not form an anastomosis distally. You should find a place where there is a good vein and a good artery, preferably a straight vein, and you connect it side to side. And usually after the 
operation, most of the time you can see uh, if you have a good vein, the vein will be already already descended after the surgery. So this is uh, arterial venous fistula side to side with ligation of the arterial branches, which is important because you don't want them to bleed after the operation. And this is a case where I ligate the distal vein so that all the blood flow goes to the proximal Catholic vein and there's a less risk of hand swelling. So this is the red artery and the Catholic vein controlled by vessel loops. It, it should be done in the theater where there's a sterile environment because many of these patients are immunocompromised. I use 10% povidone for cleansing. I use 1% lignocaine, 10 to 15 cc's for anesthesia, and I control the bleeding by vessel loops. I reduce the risk of blood clotting by using uh, standard heparin saline in the MPU, 10 cc's will be enough. To avoid kinking of the vein, I always put a stay suture either on the vein or on the branch of the vein. And uh, I, I dilate the vessels or calibrate them with a four French uh, feeding tube. So this is showing an operation in progress. This is the four French feeding tube. So if the vein has a branch, I usually try to avoid the branch. I do the anosmosis slightly higher up, making sure that the vein is not kink or distorted by the use of stay sutures, by using of stay sutures on the side branches. The, the arterial branches can occasionally be just diatomized, but usually I prefer to tie them with four silk. This is showing the anosmosis almost complete. I usually complete the anosmosis in the middle of the, of the anosmosis, usually about one centimeter, not too big and not too small. So I prefer the straight vein as I mentioned earlier. So the patient and the environment should be considered in total, not just the FVF operation itself. So I was very pleased when the nurses give the patient a bear hug. And of course the surgeon must be on time because the OTs tend to be very Coal. The most important sutures are the proline suture 7 all for the standard RCF. Uh, for patients who have got a very atherosclerotic artery, I use a, a, a taper cut a needle, which they also use it for cardiac bypass surgery. Uh, for the tying the vessels, I use a four silk. And if you're doing a BCF, you can use a proline 6 o And this is the heparin and this is the papaverin I use to bathe the vessels to avoid. Uh, Vasospasm, and these are basically the main uh, instruments that we need for doing an AVF. Now, some patients are obviously fluid overload. They do not want to be dialyzed with a catheter or they have no means of dialyzing with a catheter. So this one such patient who insists on doing the uh, AV fistula, although he said he, he cannot lie down. So we have to adjust the operating table. Sometimes we have to do the operation standing up. Sometimes the patient will say they cannot breathe halfway through the operation when you've already opened the vessels. So you have to sit the patient up and do the procedure with the patient uh, sitting up. Uh, sometimes we can give them some oxygen. Hopefully this patient completed the operation before he decided to say that he cannot breathe because of fluid in the lungs. And, uh, and actually it's probably better uh, to insert a, 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 a central catheter and dialyze them a few times. But many of them, uh, they have no resources. Uh, if the patient have a hypertension intraoperatively, they will bleed a lot. And I usually give them a nitroderm patch, uh, 10, 10, 10 milligrams. You must protect your surgery. Uh, many of these patients will still have to go back to work. So to make sure that they have an, a very important operation done there, I put a very gentle arm sling. I put a, 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 a very light crab bandage and the nurses, must be told they should not be taking the blood pressure of that arm. It's something very simple, but nurses uh, who are not into this kind of surgery in the recovery area may actually do that. And I've actually seen them do that. And patients are from very far, you must tell them that they should not use that hand for at least 48 hours to do any major manual work. So this is my standard operation record of what I've done. It's important because these patients will have future surgeries and it's important for the next surgeon to know what has been done. Uh, the, the caliber of the vessels, whether there is atherosclerosis, whether there's a good thrill. And, uh, and at the end, I put uh, 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 skin ointment so that when they do the dressing, uh, they, the dressing will not be stuck to the wound. And I give them a bowl to exercise to start two days after the uh, surgery. 
and the dialysis nurses have to be told that they, they should not be using heparin uh, for about one week. Cost is of course a concern in the state of Sarawak, the allocation by the government, uh, government servants or the dependents is, is bringing Malaysia 3,000 for, uh, for the AVF. And in my hands, more than 90% of the fistula scan have, can be used uh, after the surgery, usually after about eight weeks. So that's about my lecture for how to do AVF in my hands. Now I just show you some pictures very quickly so that I can keep within the uh, uh, time allocated to me of half an hour. So I show you very quickly some real life cases. So this patient was sent to me for AVF after they have done one operation, two operations, BCF, and finally I did the fourth operation. So usually the first operation is the best chance of doing it. And, and if you do a good operation uh, in a good patient, most of the fistulas can be used for up to 20 years. Now, this is preoperative selection, which is also just as important. Uh, if the patient has got a central catheter, either a dialysis catheter or an, a calf catheter, we should avoid doing uh, AVF in that arm because there's a risk of a central vein stenosis subsequently. Uh, some patients, uh, will have also have a, have a subclavian catheter, although we seldom use it nowadays, but if they have no veins in the neck, no suitable veins in the neck, the, the, the nephrologist may be forced to put in a subclavian line. And if you do a fistula on the same side, especially with the PCF, there's a very high risk of severe edema of the upper limb and the face. So you should avoid doing a AVF in the site where there's been some central vein uh, manipulation. Some patients have a cardiac pacer, Again, you should avoid doing a fistula on the same side, although that side is often the non-dominant hand. So you have to explain to the patient that the risk of central vein stenosis. Breast cancer is very common. And if the patient has a history of breast cancer, especially if they have radical surgery, they have radiotherapy, therapy, uh, you should avoid doing a fistula on that side. So this patient hide the history from the surgeon and the surgeon did a BCF. And of course, promptly after that, the entire left upper limb was swollen and she came to me and that's how I discovered that she sort of more or less manipulated the surgeon into doing the fistula on the non-dominant hand. And eventually the, it is only a three centimeter inflamed uh, swollen arm, which she can't use and we have to do a fistula on the other side. So even if the good vein is in the dominant hand, even if it's in the forearm, you may have to use that side for a better outcome. So this is a vein in the mid forearm, laterally placed vein. Uh, this is the wood vein, straight vein on the right side. So we choose the better vein rather than the non-dominant side. The veins on the uh, ventral surface of the hand are not suitable for dialysis because they are very thin up and they can easily blow out. So sometimes some patients will say, I've got good veins, why don't you use this vein? <laughs> so, so this is not a good vein to use as done by this surgeon. Um, they can't be used for long-term dialysis. What about my right? What about right RCF? That is my second choice. If if the left vein is vein or artery is poor, so this is just showing the operation with the stay suture posterior anastomosis performed. This is after I release the uh, the vessel loops. Now, if you do the right side, there's one disadvantage, and that is sometimes the patient would have uh, IV brandula put in further proximal, and then there is a stenosis proximal to the anastomosis, a very poor runoff, and the, the distal veins are dilated. So, so sometimes you may have to do primary rhinoplasty. Usually I would recommend the interventional radiologist because I don't do them myself. So this is showing a, a, a proximally placed place fistula when the, the vein in the wrist is poor. There are alternative sites uh, some surgeons do it at the staff box. Some surgeons do it right over the wrist, which I think is not a good idea. Uh, some surgeons use uh, the, the radial artery very proximal, just distal to the uh, to the just distal to the branching of the brachial artery. And occasionally, sometimes we have to, no choice uh, but to use the vessels in the distal forearm because the proximal forearm are all thrombosed. Now, vein is usually problem problematic. 
the artery is seldom problem problematic, but occasionally we have very atherosclerotic vessels like this patient where they have to put three bulldog clamps and a sucker uh, so that I can complete the anastomosis. And of course, there's a high risk of the patient bleeding from the atherosclerotic artery. Uh, usually, it's very difficult to, to, to even to ligate the artery. Uh, so we basically just try to control the, the bleeding as much as we can, put an, get another assistant, put a sucker, and do the anastomosis quickly. Now, there are some patients who actually you can't really do an AVF easily with good confidence. So SLE patient, completely bruised, they have preserved the right side, but the veins are also very poor and the red artery is very small. This patient uh, had instructions from the nephrologist to preserve the left hand. The nurse is not very clear what that means, so she put, just put her circumferential uh, tape to say preserve, and after a few days, the whole hand becomes swollen because of the tape to say preserve. The, the tape should be actually put on uh, vertical, vertically and not circumferentially, but this tape was put a bit late. The patient already had all the veins cannulated, and then the nephrology said, let's put a tape there. So this patient not only have the veins needled, the artery is also needled for, 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 for arterial blood gas studies. So quite often, the vessels are completely destroyed by uh, a parental intervention, and it'll be many weeks before we can have another look. So it's very important to try to do the fistula as early as possible and protect the veins. Uh, the veins is usually problematic. The, the, the artery is problematic in less than 5% of cases. And again, this is an MCQ question later on. So we should try to protect the, the vessels in the forearm and the arm for the Catholic, not just at the wrist, uh, if you have to put a line or take blood, you can use the dorsum of the, the hand. And it's very important that uh, anybody in the care of these patients with CKD or diabetes, you should put a, 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 a tape as soon as possible because the nurses and the doctors are from different shift. They are not aware of the importance of preserving the vessels for AVF. The AVF is the lifeline for the patient. So you have to preserve not only the the vessels on the left side, you should also try to preserve the vessels on the other side. So this patient had an FVF done by me uh, for, for almost, uh, almost uh, 20 years. Now there's poor return, aneurysm formation, and we plan to have a right FVF. But the, he was got hijacked by the cardiologist and promptly had the IV brandula put on the most important vein that I want to use. Uh, it was used up. For the, by, the, by the cardiologist for the angiogram. So it's most important to have a fistula first, not brandula first. So these are just examples of patients who had brandulas all over the place uh, before uh, even an intravenous drip, uh, before they actually come to see the vascular access surgeon. Correct planning is very important. Uh, this is one of the few cases that I fail. I fail to do the AVF after opening up the patient because the artery is too atherosclerotic and too small. Uh, so this is, this is one of very, my very few failed cases. And you look at the patient's chest x-ray, you can see that the IFTA is completely calcified. I put three, three vessel loops, use a sucker, and you have serious difficulty in controlling the hemostasis. Just like this shop house, which was abandoned because of very poor planning. So it's very important that you plan your AVF and you should try to have almost 100% success of your first AVF. So if, if you put a brandula on the, on the hand, not at the wrist, but higher up, that can have a cenote. Uh, some you can try, if you diagnose it earlier, you can try to do a AV fistula more proximally. Now, what about the right side? The right side, or the non-dominant side is often not reserved. So they would have IV brandula inserted here and there. And sometimes you find good vein at the wrist, but there is stenosis further up, and the patient may end up requiring a primary angioplasty after, the, after your operation because there's a stenotic segment and the vein is not maturing. Now, if the patient has obvious atherosclerotic vessels, 
like this lady with bilateral knee amputation, another patient with a necrotic foot, and one, one patient with amputation, and one patient with ischemic toes. Uh, these patients are generally speaking, many of them are not suitable for doing AVF, or if you do AVF, they don't last very long. And maybe that these patients should go on to uh, peritoneal dialysis. And I think, I think we are underusing peritoneal dialysis uh, in our, our center. So if there's a lot of atrauma, they bleed, you can't suture well, there's poor flow. Uh, and sometimes patients have a misconception. Like this patient, I did the AVF and it was used for 25 years. So now the AVF has failed and they want me to do the next AVF. And, uh, and I send the patient to another, another, another surgeon to do because I wasn't ever able to do it on that day. And, and the AVF failed. And, and, and the patient wasn't so happy. But actually, the longer the patient is on dialysis, uh, and if they have got uh, diabetes, they have hypertension, they have dyslipidemia, the vessels undergo calcification. And in fact, these patients are not even suitable for kidney transplantation because the aortic vessels are also uh, 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 calcified. So, so, so the subsequent AVF are actually more difficult to do. So the first AVF is very important. Looking after the first AVF by the dialysis staff is even more important. What about obesity? This is a very difficult one, okay? We have a lot of patients with obesity, not easy to, to control, not easy to treat, and the surgery is difficult because the vessels are buried deep inside by layers of fat, and of course, they are also difficult for cannulation subsequently. Now, the proximalization of the AVF was commonly done maybe 10 years ago. So whenever AVF fail, the surgeon is asked, to do a, 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 another anastomosis proximal to the previous one. But the problem is that there may be stenosis higher up. And on top of that, surgery is usually more difficult because there are a lot of adhesions, there are more branches to do. And the patient may say, oh, this is a repair of your previous surgery. So maybe it should be done free of charge. But usually I do far less proximalization nowadays I send the patient to the radiologist for winogram, and usually this can be tackled by the interventional radiologist by, by balloon angioplasty, although it tends to be a bit costly and they can recur and you have to redo it again. But I think it's still far better than doing another open surgery. The ulna artery can be used. I've used it only on a few occasions. The one patient that I use is a patient from Bidulu. Uh, he was one of the earliest dialysis patients in Sarawak. Uh, we have used his AVF, right, left, proximalized, BCF, BCF, and finally, we have to use this ulnar artery. So the cannulation by the staff and the positioning during dialysis is a bit difficult with the ulnar AVF. BCF tend to have more complications. They have a short, short term vein. The outcome for long-term dialysis is usually poorer. Um, there's more recirculation. And if there's a problem with infection or bleeding, they can bleed to death. They can bleed to death. I usually recommend uh, RCF on the contralateral side rather than a BCF. Patients will request for you to do a BCF because they're used to have the dialysis on that hand. Uh, but it's my, I think it's much better to do RCF. So BCF in my hands uh, for the last 20 years, well, in the earlier days, I do under local anesthesia, but subsequently, uh, the last 20 years, I always do them with anesthetics. They come faster. Uh, I request the anesthetist to give some sedation, and quite often the anesthetist will give a regional block. Uh, and and, uh, and the, the break artery is, is a rather unforgiving artery. You cannot ligate like, it uh, because it will result in ischemia of the forearm. Uh, usually I don't dissect the break artery too much. I will dissect more the Catholic vein or I use the anticupital vein and swing it across to the break artery. So if the patient had Vascular exercise done in multiple sites. And finally, there are no more superficial veins. Then if the patient has to go on to hemodialysis, then we do what's called a BBF, the basilic, using the basilic vein to the break artery. But unfortunately, the basilic vein is usually very deep inside. So you have to do a transposition of the basilic vein, either at the primary surgery. Uh, I usually do it subsequently under general anesthetic. I never do under local anesthetic. It takes quite a long operation to transpose the basilic artery into, to transpose the basilic vein to a more superficial position. Now, what about 
in some patients who have no more suitable vessels in the upper limb. What about doing uh, uh, some kind of venous graft or artificial graft using the vessels across the chest? I have never done this. Others have reported this. I think it's probably better to put a central line. Put a central line, a central cuff, central line dialysis catheter like in this young girl. What about the lower limb? Now, when I first started doing AVF, probably in 1986 or 84, we use what is called a shunt in the lower limb. The shunt is an external device connecting the posterior tibial artery to the vein. It's often a metallic shunt. Uh, I have never done uh, lower limb AVF. I think they're more prone to bleeding, infection. And of course, if there's leg ischemia, it's terrible. Uh, even we, we seldom do femoral uh, uh, dialysis catheters, although I have one or two patients uh, who, for some reason, uh, require uh, femoral perm calf. Once you put in uh, a big catheter into the femoral artery, femoral vein, there's a risk of stenosis of the femoral and the eyelid vessels, which makes them not so good for kid subsequent kidney transplant if they do, for, do go for kidney transplantation. Uh, some, of, some, some patients in Sarawak uh, are still uh, having femoral catheters inserted for dialysis. Now, the actual surgery itself, in my opinion, is only 20% of the success of the whole AVF uh, procedure. That is the planning, the teamwork, the nephrologies, and of course, for patients with vascular problems, uh, with complications, I still prefer them to my friendly vascular surgeons. And there are so many have to, to do, I think any surgeon, plastic surgeon, uh, orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons uh, who are interested in this line, uh, we can work together as, as, a, as a team. And, and if patients sometimes, because I've been working in this line for a long time, some patients prefer me to do the surgery. But I tell them that now this is a time when you have to go and see a vascular surgeon or to go and see interventional radiologist because now we are specialized. We think of the best procedure with the best outcome by the best doctor for the patient. Of course, a happy patient is very important. This is a patient who requested for, for a, a photograph with me after the surgery. He's an IJC catheter, and we did a, a, a fistula on the right hand. So it's the, it's the patient, the environment, the teamwork, the whole team involved in looking after the patient, the nephrologists, dialysis nurses, pre and post, uh, uh, that pre and post surgery, if the patient requires uh, uh, taking blood, setting a line, always remember the dorsum of the hand can be used, preferably starting from the non-dominant hand instead of going straight away for the catholic vein uh, or, or for the patient. Uh, I have many slides. Anybody want any slides at all on the surgical access, you can send me an email and I will give you the slides. Thank you for your attention. And this is the MCQ that uh, I've been asked to set. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five. There are five statements, and uh, and uh, you have to pick up which one is false, which one is false, and then the organizers will give you a prize. Thank you so much for your attention.